Hi there, I'm Ali Mulkarim. Today on behalf of Tech Forum, I'm going to talk about object-oriented programming. If you're already from an object-oriented background, then this talk may bore you because this is going to be very detailed and mostly for beginner to advanced level. So if you have never done any object-oriented programming before or have few knowledge, then this is the session that might help you object-oriented programming for the rest of your life. Finally, I can promise you that this is going to be the best object-oriented programming video that you ever going to find on internet. I'm from developers organism. We make products for developers, not only for users. Currently our website is in under construction. However, we are not really interested in our website right now, but we are interested in our products. Presently, we are doing a big project called Developers Blog, which is going to be an open source free CMS system in csharp.net. Well, you might ask why. Even though there are a lot of solutions already exist in the market, the challenge is to make the better product than all the existent one. And we are analyzing for three months and we already have a great team we're going to make a product which is far ahead than all the existing product right now so if you really want to join us you can do that this is the email address that if you really want to join you can mail us and we will be really happy to see you on board so prerequisites I'm assuming that you already have basic C-sharp programming skills in additions with namespace and function concept. Don't be freak out if you don't know UML because we're going to talk about it. It's a very simple concept but it's really a prerequisite but we're going to go with examples so that you understand what UML is. We're going to cover these following topics. Some of those are in details and some of those are in brief and complex ones are going to be very detailed and easy ones are going to be in brief. You may have heard from your colleagues, friends or read an article about object rendered programming or OOP then you have Google and end up here. In the previous days when I teach object rendered programming I give people example that it's a formalities and it's a sum of it's kind of a ritual that you should follow. But it turns out it's not a ritual, it's kind of a required thing to do the programming. Seven years ago, I wrote a program uh, for a company which was very good at the time. And the little object rendered programming I know, I just skipped. And turns out after seven years later, uh, not seven years, few years later, uh, when they came to me for some change and I was really freaked out. That crap I wrote and technically the changes uh, were for changes that I have to make was really very simple and technically it was very it was really two hours work but simple, the system was so devastating and so inflexible I have to spend one week solve the problem. So you can get my point that uh, if you don't use object-oriented programming, your system will become inflexible. And we're going to talk about in details that some of the times overdoing object-oriented programming also make your system inflexible. When people talk about object-oriented programming, they really meant five things. And first, they meant class, second object, third inheritance, and encapsulation, and finally, polymorphism. It's not that these are the five things that only exist. There are many things, but these are the five things that people really understand. Object-oriented programming history began around 1960s when MIT tried to develop a robot with object-oriented design. From that concept, 
the procedural programming changes into object oriented programming. So let's see our concepts in detail. In high school, I never took biology, but turns out that somehow biology contributed into computer science and the class concept first came from biology. The purpose of the class is to organize your kid. Class is an abstract representation or an blueprint of an object. Let's say you have a person class. A class says a person should have a first name or last name, but it does not say what the first name would be, what the, what the last name should be, something like that. It's just abstract. In simple words, a class is a collection of methods and properties. A class should have two layers. One is data and another is logic. And data layer is also known as attributes or properties and logic also known as functions, methods or behaviors. So let's see UML. We have talked about UML that you should have know this but it's really very simple. I don't really think that you should have to Google. Uh, just make a box and write the name of the class on top of the UML. Let's say it's a person class, then you should write the person top of the box. And then in the first half, first half, you should write the properties of the data or the attributes of the person. And in the second half, you're going to write the methods, behavior, functions of the person class. Uh, UML is really represent a class in short. That's it. So let's see a UML of a person class. Let's say this is a person and a person should have a first name, last name, date of birth, address, gender, and these are data. Or attributes or properties. And the second half will contain the behaviors or functions or methods. Whatever you say is correct. Behavior logic methods or functions so let's say you have a calculator uh, application and you really want to use the classes so what you can do is make separation of your logics logics and into separate classes let's say you have basic basic functionality of the class so you put those basic functionality in the basic calculation class and you have scientific calculation part you put those into scientific calculation class and this way you can organize your code. This is the purpose of the class. So what is object? So a class is an abstract representation uh, like this and the object is like the house itself building on that blueprint or the abstraction. So if you zoom that this is the blueprint of the house which is the class the object is making the house uh, on top of that blueprint so a person let's say the person class we have here when we create the person class equals new the new creates the person class and this new instantiate the person object into this person smaller case person so this is the object and this is the class that's it and this is the data type that we are picking up So you have seen the object. So this is the object creation. So how you can uh, set a property or change the properties in a class, it's very simple. After creation of the object, write the object and put a dot and you'll see the properties of that object. In that in this case we have first name last name so I just dot the person and uh, then I got the first name and then I'm putting value allies and this is how you set values and last name Roman son this is how I set values and how you get the values it's very simple it's like setting the values but uh, taking it in another variable that's how you get the variable that's it now let's see some coding. 
before taking our hands on on coding, you should have to know a few things about class. Anything you write in the class is known as the members of the class. So whatever you write inside the class is a member of the class. In addition, by default, all the members in the class are private. That means if you don't define any access modifier, we are not really going deep into the access modifier right now, but uh, try to remember that it will uh, help you to cope with other lessons later on. That when you do not write any access modifier, it assumes that a member inside a class is private. And the private is the most restricted modifier, access modifier, and private uh, do not let you access any members inside the class unless it has any other modifier. So if you do not declare any modifier before any member, that means you cannot access that member outside of the class. And any member inside the class you can access by its name or you could write this and that would be the explicit way to call a member inside a class this and the member name this dot and then the member name so let's say you have a property or a field let's say first name to access that you could write inside a method first name and then you have the property but you can also write these dot first name these are the same thing so it also solves a problem when you have a parameter as a first name same as your member in the class to differentiate those you can use this when you say this it will explicitly mean that you are meaning or you are uh, trying to access a member inside the class and when you don't write the this it means you are trying to access the parameter so this is the things that uh, you should know before moving on to the coding. So let's dive in. This is a pretty simple console application and we have another uh, project uh, attached to it. It is an empty project, uh, class library project. So in this project we have a basic console application and another class called person. The person that we have seen in the slides is defined here. It's very simple, write, write the fields. We have written the fields, public fields. These are known as fields and uh, this is public modifier. We are going to talk about access modifiers later but for now just understand that public means that everyone can access it. That's it. So we really put those pro uh, fields to public access modifier so uh, everyone can access it and we have two methods in the slides you have seen many behaviors but we only uh, write two methods that's it for simplification so that's our class so so how to write a class uh, let me write it again so that you can understand write class and the class name in this case person maybe two is a per person class and uh, let's write the properties public and in this case these are uh, the fields not properties don't confuse the properties with fields try to remember that these are the properties we're going to talk about uh, sorry these are the fields and we're going to talk about the uh, properties later on so string first name first name let's say just and to write a method write a method work and define the method that's it so that's how you're going to create a class this is it so a class should be one class should be in one uh, class file but you can write multiple class in one uh, CS file but it's not really recommended the best practice is to put your uh, other classes or interfaces into separate files this way you could find your classes very easily and uh, the best way is to keep your uh, class name as your c -sharp file name so then in this case the uh, c -sharp file name is person so I write my uh, class name is person if you go to the program 
this has a class name of program like this so this is the best convention but you could write whatever you want it will not complain and it will run just fine so that's it so we have seen the class let's see uh, an instantiation of the class so person person you could write anything you don't have to write only the person but for simplification I'm just writing the object name as person that's it and new like this so to change the first name I just go to the first name and say that first name is Elias that's it for now that's it and let's say that I tell my person to walk and let's see what's happening Elias is walking that's it it happens so, like this because I have a console.writeLine method in uh, the walk method as you can see it's very simple nothing uh, complex here so that's how you uh, instantiate an object from a class and then you manipulate the object by accessing the properties or calling a method to call a method you uh, when whenever you see in a programming language in most popular programming language this uh, uh, parentheses is you have to understand that this is a method so it's a method logic or behavior what you have what we have discussed earlier so that's it uh, and let's go to our slides now so let's see a class constructor because a class uh, when a class is created the constructor is the first method that is invoked a class could have zero or multiple constructor even though a class doesn't have a constructor it will call the constructor implicitly so constructor is always called whenever you call new new then a uh, person the constructor is implicitly called even though there is no constructor when you write a constructor it is explicitly called so let's see some examples of constructor encoding so here I'm in the Visual Studio uh, we are going to the person class to write the constructor what you can do is write a public and then write the same name as your uh, class name that's your constructor the first uh, the exact name as your class name that's your constructor so you can have zero or multiple constructor we're going to talk about multiple constructor later but you can have multiple constructor by overloading method we're not going to talk about overloading right now we're going to talk about overloading rate later so when we talk about overloading you'll understand that how you can create multiple uh, constructors and you could do something uh, like this you are uh, initiate, initiating uh, let's say an array or something like that whatever this type of object you do uh, work you do you can do it in the constructor section so let's just go very simple and write line that a person is created person is created with name let's see that what happens to the name so uh, first name that's it so let's run it run the code we don't need any change in our code as if whenever we call the person the uh, person is created method is executed but the person name is really empty so it really doesn't show anything you really go to the code it doesn't it's really empty empty string null string so it doesn't show anything so uh, it only uh, shows those those two console right lines because uh, this was the first one executed and the next executed when the work method is called that's it it's very simple not complicated so another thing about the constructor uh, 
in Visual Studio you could uh, write constructor very easily if you write CTOR and hit tab you will have your constructor that's it so let's just delete those line because because we are not really interested in the constructor of a person right now uh, let's go to our slides so let's see how to create a destructor a destructor is used to uh, clean up your memory or to make your application more efficient uh, but luckily for C sharp uh, if you have any memory leaks or memory problems the garbage collector will kicks in time to time and clean up your memory you really ha don't have to do this but sometimes it's really a good practice to use the destructor and when you have a huge list of items it's really a good practice to remove it uh, in the destructor so let's see how to create a destructor in a class so let me switch over to Visual Studio here I am in the Visual Studio uh, we could go to our person class and I have separated my person class with those uh, regions I really like to separate my codes and like to use the regions and you could separate your codes like the regions I, I will show you. you could do it by control K and then S then you go to Visual Studio and go to region and then I'm going to say that destructors destructor because you can have only one or zero destructor to write a destructor you have to uh, uh, put the tilde sign I call it tilde sign I really don't know that what it's called but really remember that it's really called the tilde sign so whatever it is uh, put this and then write your class name and that's it that's your destructor so uh, if you have a huge list you should clean up your list but for now we're going to just print out that uh, the structure is called that's it so let's really like uh, write uh, around the program and let's see what happened and I'm pretty sure the destructor will not be called so why did I make mistake Okay, so that's it. Destructor is not called. So destructor why is not called? Because uh, my person is not uh, destroyed. So let's really destroy it by setting it to now. Because it doesn't have any memory reference to it. So a garbage collector will kicks in and destroy it at some point. And this is when the construct. Uh, uh, classes destructor will be called but uh, for C sharp uh, if we run this you, you will not see this happen right away uh, to do this happen right away you can do what you can do is call the garbage collector write GC GC is the garbage collector and say collect that's it and now if I run my uh, code I'll see that the structure is called now let's see some uh, complex scenarios not really complex just the simple scenarios but uh, now I'm going to go uh, break some rules that I have said earlier but that's just for the convenience of file for this demonstration but it's not the right way to do the work that we have discussed earlier and I have so many files in my project and we're going to include one by one as we need those so we're going to include the destructor class and here I have uh, introduced two classes in one file it's just because that well uh, it's just a demo purpose but uh, on a professional project you shouldn't do that so here I have a simple destructor class and then I'm just going to uh, comment out this portion because we are not there yet uh, we have really a list where we have created uh, we make a capacity of 2000 if you know the list objects it already creates the 2000 elements or array in the memory heap so 
at the end of it I'm going to uh, set the list to null so that it wouldn't take any more memory at the heap and then I'm calling the destructor it will be same as before but this time the method will be different and uh, we're really cleaning up something it's not really very fancy but let's just do it destructor class oh let's see so let's show you something else here we are uh, doing the person and then we are saying that the object name so the first thing you define is your uh, data type so a person is a data type whenever you make a class it it's a data type and a class's discrete name is data structure so whenever you see uh, that it is about data structure you have to understand that it's about class but uh, in very detailed manner that's it so what you can do as a C sharp programming write var so you have to really understand the var var is like I'm really too lazy to figure out the type so what happens is at the compile time var is compiled to person the person will be replaced into the var you cannot write like per p that's it if you compile it you'll get an error yes that's so let's just do it very quick yeah that you cannot compile it because you're implicitly defining a thing but you're not defining that what the uh, thing would be so it's really giving you an error so it at the compile time the compiler doesn't know that what type it should put so that's it for var and there is also a dynamic data type and uh, let's really go over dynamic very quick because many people are confused with dynamic and var and dynamic and var are not really two same things dynamic resolves at runtime and var resolves at compile time so whatever happens uh, uh, here will be defined at compile time when I put the uh, start command and dynamic resolves when you need the object or at the runtime when you uh, call the object it will resolve dynamic is weekly type if you have ever have any idea about weekly type C sharp is the same type strongly type and weekly type so let's not go very deep into this because there are very deep conversations about this type of topics just go very simple and um, create our class and this time I'm just going to go var I'm not going to go new destructor class that's it destructor and then I'm going to set the destructor equals now and if I run it again I will not see the destructor method is called so if I run it I'll see the capacity but destructor method is not still called so to do that I will have to again call the garbage collector and see that the structure method is a uh, call and the least was now at this moment so I know that it is clean so that's how you can use the destructor now let's quickly move over to our slides static modifiers we're going to go very deep into this static modifier because the first time I learned it I have to struggle a lot so and in my career I have seen many people who really uh, doesn't get the static modifier very quickly so we're going to go very slow and very detailed in this static modifier topic two things that you should remember that static members can be accessed without instantiating the class and static modifiers modifier members are load uh, at first the application is run so if you have a static variable or a static object in your application it will be shared across uh, every user that's the summary so let's really dive into it If you're marking a class as static, 
then you have to mark all the members as static. If you don't do that, you will face a in compilation error. And if you have a static class, you cannot inherit it as well as create it. And static classes don't have any constructor or destructors. So what about the members? So public static members can be accessible by class name only from anywhere without instantiating the class. So you instantiate a class by new keyword so that uh, you can you can access any a public static member without instantiating uh, the class and from anywhere by its name only. It's a very important concept. And we are going to go very deep into it. And if you have a private static member or only static member inside a class, uh, then you can only static uh, you can only access it from uh, the static members only that's the two concepts that you should remember for the members and we're going to go very deep into it with examples and let's see the next slide uh, assume that this is Visual Studio and uh, I'm writing my statement and uh, let's see some code let's say that I have a class A and a method public static method print and I have a private non static method that is foo now if I try if I want to access the print method of that class A I can write the class name directly class A and put a dot and then call the method and it will run just fine let's say you have or we have another class B and we have three places one is public constructor which is a public method assumed to be and another is private method and another is private static method so if we want to access the uh, public static method of that class A what we can do is write the class name and dot and then uh, call the method and it will work just fine so same is also true for anything method and the static anything method and uh, you could pause the video and go by line and uh, try to understand and if you have any problem mail me it is very simple and uh, if you have time try to compile it in Visual Studio you will get the correct result so let's say you have a private static method or uh, only static method which doesn't have any uh, modifier access modifier in front of it so here is my private static method uh, print and I have a non-static method and a static method in my class so let's say I want to access that uh, private static method with my class name and I can do that because it's not a public method and if I try to access it by the this keyword I will again fail because it is a non-static method and we cannot call static method from a non-static method and let's try it on the static method if we do that these dot print will be successful because we can call static methods or members from static members and if we try to access again with class a dot print it will not be succeeded and let's see uh, the example for class B and for all the examples we will be failed because it is a private static member we cannot access it outside the class so that's it uh, it's a very simple example and it really describes all of the static members abilities so if you have any questions mail me right away I will really get back to you as soon as possible so let's visualize that how static objects work because uh, that's really a very uh, good programming skill that if you understand static uh, because it's sometimes very memory efficient and sometimes it's very uh, memory inefficient so if you're not careful it is very memory inefficient if you're careful it's memory efficient so let's see let's say you have a web app and 
you have a class B as a static class in your uh, web app. So before starting the app, maybe you just uh, put it in the cloud or maybe one user is trying to access it, the static B class will be created. That's it. That's the first thing that is going to happen. And then the web application will run and the other classes and in this case I'm assuming that the web application only has class A. So this is a normal class and uh, this is created because user 1 requested something from the class A but static class is created. If the user 1 needs it or doesn't need it, it doesn't matter. Since it's a static class, it will be created and shared across your application. Let's say user 2 comes in at the same time and class A will be again created. It will be again created for user 2. But class B will not be created. It will be shared across. So let's say you have user 3 and it will be again class A will be created. So let's say that user 2 is gone, so class A will be gone, but static will still remain there. Let's say your user 2 again comes in, then uh, class A will be again created specifically for user A, and the, these are all in other instance. Everyone are going to occupy memory for class A. Class A will be replicated three times for three users, but class B will be shared. Let's say user 2 is gone, so the class A for user 3 is gone and so on. At last when you have no user or when you practically closed your application, your static members will go. That's it. Passing reference parameter is very interesting and um, lots of people are failed to explain and uh, lots of newbies are really uh, suffer from understanding this concept so that's why uh, it's not a functions session but it's really about the function and why I choose this topic it will come up when I really finish talking about it so I have seen that a lot of newbies suffer uh, to understand passing parameters as a reference type or uh, the value type so MSDN says that the primitive types are passed passed as copied or a value type. So value type means it's copied and uh, non-primitive types are passed as reference. So at this moment if you don't know about this you are really confused. So let me give you some light on this topic and let's say that I have these functions. So I'm saying that this function is a non-reference type. So I'm choosing, uh, explicitly choosing this string because the MSDN says that the um, only the primitive types passed as a value and non-primitive type string is a non-primitive type. So primitive types are char, uh, int, double, decimal, date, something like that. But if you go to primitive type c sharp primitive you will see the long list so uh, other than that uh, all are non primitive types so string is a non primitive type so when you pass a string it should be changed and give you the different result that you expect so in this case i'm just marking as static so that i could call it from the main function that's it static doesn't play any role here so let's see uh, I have x equals to hello world assuming that it's Visual Studio I'm just putting it in slides so that you could understand uh, uh, easily so I print it and it prints hello world and let's say I pass my x to the change function and these x and x are not same if you know from the functions lesson uh, this is like in Bangladesh and this is like in uh, Maldives, something like that. So in two different places and each of those doesn't know of each other. The only way they know by passing it to the function. These x and these x are not same. 
after passing this this will be same or be linked so msdn says that when you pass the x it passed as reference type so if i passed it and uh, i changed it so reference type means when you change an object or change something uh, it will remain same for uh, finishing that function so the change should change the change string x and after that it should print uh, change but if you run it in visual studio it will give you that hello world it will be still same so when i see it at first time i was really puzzled because they say that it's a reference type and uh, I couldn't really understand that how it's really happening so when I asked a PhD guy he was also failed to describe the fact that what is going under the hood so what he says that it's just immutable or when you see a type is immutable it means it's a fixed type but it really doesn't explain a lot so we're going to go very deep into it so next what I'm doing I'm uh, uh, passing my x to a change ref function which is a reference type function if you know from the ref keyword in visual uh, c sharp so ref really does is uh, change anything if you pass an integer uh, with the ref keyword uh, after that uh, if you modify the uh, integer you will have the modified integer after the function is executed so after that it really prints changed but i shouldn't have to do that because only for primitive type primitive types i should have to do this but since it's not a primitive type it should be passed as reference so what's going wrong here so let's see some of those in terms of memory so string is a mutable type which means it's a fixed type so what happens is whenever you create a string it creates in a new memory location it really doesn't change the previous string let's say you first time say hello world and next time you're changing the hello world to change so it never really changed the hello world what it does it uh, looks up to the heap or memory and then sign a new location for changed and make a new string that's why it's a fixed time every time you change it it really makes a new string it doesn't change the previous one that's why it's a fixed type or said to be immutable so let's see in terms of memory that what happens so when you say that string x equals hello world it really creates a new uh, string in the memory hello world so when you call uh, the uh, console that right line it really prints the hello world from that memory heap so when you call change so it really passes the reference of the location into the function here into the function here after that when we are doing change x equals change so x equals change is really doing a new thing to a string so it will create a new string to a new memory location and let's say that new location is here and x is created here but after the function is passed it really remembers the previous memory reference location that's it so when it's print it prints hello world but it really changed in the uh, process of the function since that uh, it creates a, a new creates in a, into a new memory location so you cannot see it so when you pass it as reference what does it it also passes the memory location to your function reference string but this time when it changed change to x it also creates a new memory location change creates a string changed to a new memory location and uh, when you get out of the function what it does it gives the reference of the location to your X so whenever you write it you'll get the same result as changed that's it so what happens when we have primitive types let's say an int so what will happen 
So let's say we have an int of 51 and creates a new memory location. Uh, it creates in a new memory location with 51. So when you print x, it prints that uh, number. And when you pass it to change, it really copies the x to here. So how it does is it makes a new copy of your previous uh, number or previous primitive type, whatever it is, maybe date or time or something like that. But uh, when you changed it, it changed in that uh, copied location. So when you get back, you really don't get back the location that you are pointing to previously. That's one. So you really don't get it. So you really print the 51 and if you really pass it to a reference type function so what happens is this time it really passes the reference reference and when you change it you really change it here and so when you print it you'll get the 50, uh, 12 there that's it that's how uh, reference types works so if you really don't get it mail me I will try to help The reason behind uh, giving you this example is you can pass your class as a data type in a function parameter. So whenever you pass a class as a function parameter, what happens is it passes as a reference type. So you really don't, uh, so that you don't confuse with the value type or reference type. That's why I explained it. So finally, this is the class pattern that you have seen so far. Uh, the third bracket means optional, that you can write it or don't write it, it's really up to you. And uh, you haven't seen generics yet, but you'll see it very quick. And the format is you first slide write the uh, access modifier which is defined here you can have only public or internal for the class or nothing at all uh, if you don't have anything it means internal internal class so access modifier then modifier the modifier can be picked from this list i don't know if there is any kind more but uh you could experiment it but so far what i have seen is these four types you can get in C sharp so if you have another type uh, let me know but it's not really important because all of those are not really uh, helpful all the time few of those you're going to use all the time and uh, identifier is the name that you're going to put for your class and you really can't have any combination from this list and Static, we have talked very detail about it. You cannot create it as well as inherited the class. And sealed means that you cannot just inherit it. That's it. And partial, it's my favorite. It's really after uh, .NET 4.0 maybe or 2.5. I, I really don't remember, but uh, I really asked this question in interview. Uh, so if you are interviewed by me, be prepared for this. So. Uh, what partial does is if you have the uh, classes in same namespace at the compile time they're just merged if you really go to msdn you'll see some uh, excellent example I, I have some in my demo projects let's see some examples so we are in visual studio uh, let's really switch over to this project it's really an empty project so i have few classes in there this is the A class, which really have some uh, properties, fields with some access modifiers. And this project is for checking access modifiers. When we get to it, we'll talk more detail about it. So we have a same class name as class A in a different directory, uh, class A. But I really put the namespaces same. As you can see that the namespace is same as this and 
If you see the slides, it says that partial classes only combine or merge if they're in the same namespace. So if I really include these files in my project, let's include the class C as well. So what should happen is in the compile time, they should be in the same class. So in class A, in this different folder, I really have only one field, what says that public int, it's a public, so it could be accessed from anywhere. So uh, partial public field, that's it. So that you understand that uh, the partial classes are merged. And I just put the partial keyword before the class. And here you uh, don't see that there is a partial, but you still can put a partial, it doesn't matter. But um, there should be one class which shouldn't have partial, but I really don't think that compiler will mind if I really put this. Yeah, compiler doesn't mind. but. The convention or the best thing to do is put your one class that doesn't have the partial in it. So uh, partial means there is uh, some other class which is same name as this. That's it. So in the compile time those both classes should be merged and Visual Studio is very smart. We don't have to compile even though we compile but if if you just put the dot you'll see that the partial public field is there so if i modify the namespace let's say i make it to change something like this so if i just change the namespace and if i came to a and if i really try to access the partial public field i can't so let me go over to our slides after excluding those. So you can also have sealed partial. Sealed partial is you cannot inherit it and it will be merged at compile time if the namespaces are same. So we are very close to ending the class session. It's the conclusion. And whenever you create a class, you create a new type of data. So when you create a string, it's really a string class object. And when you create a list, it's a list type of object, something like that. So Another thing about the class, uh, some people I have seen over the years that got afraid that when you see a data structure class or something heard about this is about data structure, data structure is just a decent name for class. Don't freak out. It's a simple thing. In data structure, we really talk depth about many various kinds of data types like the list or link list, something like that. But don't be freak out. It's just the class which represents a different format. That's it. So now we are hit the inheritance topic, our uh, third most important topic in object-oriented programming. So there are many definitions about inheritance and I really simplified in into one sentence and very short that inheritance is something like getting something from previous generation. That's it getting something from previous generation so let's see a scenario where inheritance is not there so let's see when we really need the inheritance first so we have these properties of a person and a person could walk talk and eat and let's say student student also have same type of properties first name last name date of birth address gender something like that but extra field CGPA completed course and so on and he also have behavior like display something like that and a teacher also have first name last name date of birth something like that and a method or behavior display so how we can implement it we just write the code so let's see some code we are in Visual Studio so 
let's switch over to our uh, previous project and here you can see that we really don't have any code we just cleaned it up and uh, there is a uh, in there is two classes student and uh, teacher that I have written earlier so the data fields that I have copied from the person class because these are really same uh, and I put it in data uh, region and the extended properties like uh, subject proficiency su office hours department etc I put in the extended region so so that I could really uh, differentiate those and really see that which are really extra and display in the display method I'm just saying that uh, uh, his first name last name proficiency and so on uh, displaying all the fields that's it but I'm really copying these fields and in the students I'm also doing the same thing I'm copying these all fields from the person class so so that I really don't have to type it and the extended fields are written here and in the display property it's very simple and straightforward I'm just printing the student details about the class but we really don't need uh, eat um, or walking etc in our uh, student class because we really don't want it to be more complicated so that's it so let's go to our program and let's really write some code and let's say I want to make the student class so student that's it so if I really say the first name first name or say let's say uh, class two last name Roman son and let's really display our student and we really didn't initialize the completed course let's say fine fine okay so let's just print it so you'll see that we have a default date of birth and others are written here so um, completed course and so, so on so as you can see that uh, it's very simple display class but what you were seeing that I have copied many properties in both of those student and teacher uh, classes which is really uh, not good practice so let me switch over to our slides the thing that I'm doing copying and pasting is really not a good practice so we've seen the code so the same things should not be repeated that's a, a design principle so the principle is principle says that do not repeat yourself try and Ruby is really the first programming language that really emphasizes more on this topic principle was there but Ruby really influences or emphasizes it more and after Ruby many programming languages really influ uh, influenced by it uh, if you really see that what we can do since we have same properties from person to student we could make a relationship from the person to a student and this relationship is said to be an easier relationship so a student is a person teacher is a person it seems logical and let's see that how we are going to do it so we are grayed out this portion because we have this portion in the person so what we are going to do is we're going to inherit it from the person so that we really don't have to write the same properties again and again for teacher we're inheriting the person so 
since we're getting the properties from the person, so the person is said to be the super class or parent class or base class. Since the student and teacher are derived from person class, it is known as child class or derived class or subclass. So inheritance, let's say you have a person class dot dot dot. I'm not uh, putting the all codes here. So let's say you have the student class. So what you want to do is inherit from person. So teacher, you want to do the same. So that when you initialize the a student, you could set the first name equals allies. There should not be any problem. So in C sharp, what we do is put the colon in front. That means we are inheriting from the person. That's it. And C sharp and Java and some other language like PHP only supports inheritance from one class at a time so you cannot inherit from multiple class at a time but C++ uh, programming language like that uh, supports multiple class, class inheritance at the same time so that's really an important point so if you really say that student is a type of person and is a type of let's say X and Y then it will not compile it will give you a compilation error so after that you just sign the values let's see some of the coding in visual studio previously we have seen our student and teacher class without inheritance now we're going to see the inheritance and we have uh, the inheritance coding in here so here is my student class which is inherited from person and I haven't included the namespace. To include the namespace, I'm just put my mouse cursor and press control dot to uh, import the namespace. And here I'm saying that uh, op dot polymorphism. That's it. So that's my person. And same thing I have to do for the teacher class. And when I do that, a reader will be gone. And here I'm achieving the same thing but I'm not copying the same thing from the person class. Uh, in the previous example as you've seen that I have copied these properties but the uh, fields but here I haven't copied those fields. I've just applied the extended field and it will work just fine as before. So let's see some of those in action. So this time because it's in the different namespace as you can see that the namespace is different so be but inheritance so I have to initialize uh, import that namespace namespace and if I really display it I'll have the same thing so this time I really don't have to write the repeated things so thanks to inheritance so I hope you understand this concept let's uh, move on to our slide You can create your super class or parent class or base class from your subclass or child class. Uh, if you think about it, the super class, the person, have some properties. Let's say A for the first name, first name, F, first name. And if you remember from the previous slides, student also have first name but it also have some extended properties so the student got more properties than the person a person requires some of the properties from the student so the parent class or the super class can be created from its subclass or from its uh, child class so you can create a person student from a student class or instantiate a person class from a student class. You can do the same for the teacher as well. But if the types are not same, let's say uh, that you want to create a teacher class from a student class, you will fail. 
and it's also vice versa if you really try to create a student class from a teacher class you will also fail so another thing that you cannot create your super subclass from your super class so that's very interesting so as I've said earlier that a student class have all the properties of person plus it has some extended properties so it really needs those extended properties to instantiate by a person but a person has less properties than a student so a student class cannot be created from a person class and so if you try to create a student class a student object from a person class you will fail and if you try to create the teacher object from the person class you will also fail so calling the base class constructor let's say you inherited a class class let's say you have a class a and a is inherited by class B and you really want to call the constructor of class A from class B how can you do that so let's see some example in coding so we are here in Visual Studio and we are with our person class and we have inherited the student from the person class so let's write a simple uh, constructor in the person class just like this that just display that the person is created yeah I mean run class so that's it uh, now let's go over to your any of the inherited class and write your constructor CTOR. so how you can call a base constructor it's really easy write the base and that's it a base constructor will be called so if you really want to if you really have uh, multiple constructor it will be very helpful so if I run my project you'll see that person is created so if you remember from the first lesson uh, or first examples of class that uh, the constructor will always be invoked uh, implicitly or explicitly so we really don't have to call the uh, constructor these explicitly for the basic or uh, for only the uh, first constructor it will be always called uh, implicitly so if I run I will get the same result so it will be helpful when you have multiple uh, constructor we are going to talk about multiple constructor later in this video. So let's say I have an example, uh, and uh, in example I have class A, class B, and class C. And class B is inherited from class A, and uh, class C is inherited from class B. And I really want to call base methods from these inheritance so let's see some examples I have a definition of class A and I have a walk method base walk so it will call the walk method and let's say I have another example of uh, these dot walk so see the difference between these and base this is all about this lesson so when I call this it also calls the uh, walk method because there is no inheritance there uh, so when you call base first name it's just called this these first name call this same but differs when we call in the inheritance inheritance section so if we call now base dot walk it will mean that uh, point to the function to your base class or the inherit uh, parent class that's it so when we say this it means a method inside this class not outside of the class but this class 
So this what means this method. If we call this from this B class, you have to understand that. So if we say that uh, base dot first name, it will represent the first name from the base class or parent class. And if we say this dot first name, it will represent this first name. So let's say I have C class C, which is inherited from class B, of course. So I made a mistake. So let's pretend that it's really uh, inherited from class B. And when we call the base dot walk, it will call the base method of its parent class. And these means this method, and base means the parent class's first name, and these means this class's first name. That's it. So this is about the base and the this example that how it differs from one another. We really haven't talked about modifiers, access modifiers in details, and this is the time that we're going to talk about in details of access modifiers. So uh, I really uh, conclude those details from MSDN and I rewrote those in my words and some of those are hard to understand from this written description. And as you can see that I have made also a pyramid. So where you can see that the public has no restriction and private has all the restrictions. And uh, in this topic, uh, when you see the assembly, uh, it says the assembly only. The assembly means that it uh, only works for a single project. So in a solution Visual Studio, you could have multiple projects. And if you remember from our project, we have two projects. One is a class library and another is console application. So. A project means the assembly file. For simplification, we are uh, just understanding that uh, when you compile a project, you will get assembly file. It could be exe or dll, uh, and whatever it is, it is just an assembly, and we are really interested in that assembly. So let's go to Visual Studio and see some coding about access modifiers. So here I am in Visual Studio in our simple uh, project and uh, as you can see that we have two projects in our solution. So one is uh, class library and another is uh, the console application. The console application is going to output a exe file, a class library will output a DLL file. And we have referenced the class library file to our project uh, check access modifier. You can add your other projects library reference from this dialog box and go to solutions and add your uh, other projects assembly to your project. So uh, whenever you uh, listen that I'm talking about assembly, you have to understand that it basically means a project. So let's really go over very quick. We have two classes in the uh, check access modifier project. So here I have all the uh, access modifiers written so that you can understand at once. So in a class, when you do not define any access modifier before any member, it could be a method, a property, a fill. If you do not declare a access modifier, what it's going to be, uh, what the default modifier in the class is private. So a default modifier for a class is internal. A default modifier for a member in a class in C Sharp is private. So a private member cannot be accessed outside of the class. So you have to be very careful about it. So whatever you declare, with private or without any modifier cannot be accessed outside of the class. That's it. And if you have an internal, then it can be accessed inside the project or inside the assembly only. That's it. So if you have a protected modifier, 
uh, a protected can only be uh, accessible if you derived it. It could be derived from uh, other uh, assemblies or other projects or it could be derived in the same assembly or the same project. So let me give you an example of this protected. So protected and internal, we have already declared the class A, class A like this. So we really just go dot, you'll see that internal is available inside the assembly or in this case, the whole project. And uh, the protected is not there. Protected is not there. So to access the protected, so if you want to access the protected, let's say you define a class, it says just class, it's not a good practice to make class like this, let's say class D, and class D is really inherited from class A, and uh, the C tor, if I write uh, these dot, then I can, you can see that I can access the protected member. And this is also true from uh, uh, another assembly or another project as well. We're going to see it. So this is about the protected and uh, the protected is the most common modifier in PHP, uh, C sharp and um, so on. So what is protected and internal? It means that protected or internal, it will work as protected or internal, both at the same time. So what's going to happen is uh, if you just dot A, you'll get the protected internal. Just because it has the at attributes or the qualities of internal as well. So internal modifiers are accessible from uh, a, a, uh, as the current assembly only or the current project only so that okay, internals are uh, available from current assembly as well as it will also be available from uh, other projects so here I have another class and let's just quickly uh, uh, so I have already inherited the class from class A. If you see that I have already imported the namespace check class modifiers and here is the check class modifiers. So what I did is uh, inherited the uh, check access modifier from uh, class A. So if I really write this dot, you can see that I can access the protected internal uh, because just because I have inherited it and I can also uh, access the protected Y but the protected Y if you remember protected Y cannot be accessed uh, uh, inside from the project or inside from the assembly without being derived but the protected internal can be accessed so that's the difference between protected and protected internal so then we have public it has no restriction at all so far you have seen public and private we have talked earlier that you cannot uh, access it outside of the class so we have static as well Ac static to access that static class static member you just uh, say the class name and then dot and get the access a static member so if you really want to access the static you cannot get it by this after inheriting you just can only access it uh, by its class name if you remember from the static modifier lesson so that's it about access modifiers if I miss something mail me but I think that's it so let's move on to our slide Extension methods are released in .NET Framework 2.5. Extension methods are released to solve a special kind of problems. Let's say the person class you have seen earlier. Let's say that someone created the person class and give you the assembly file only and you don't like some of the uh, things that the person class do and you want to add methods, not modify, but add some methods to the person class. 
and you can do it by the extension methods and if you have ever heard of link link is based on extension methods so let's see some of those in coding here we are and uh, let's add our extension method to our project and you can see that writing an extension method is very easy but the requirements is to writing the extension method you have to make the method static so you have learned the static so far so you have to make the method static and then after that uh, whatever name you choose doesn't matter you have to put this keyword after the first parameter that's it you have to put the this after the first parameter and then you write the data type that you want to add this method to so in this case that I'm just doing it to the person class and the person class is here so uh, as you've seen previously that in the inheritance if I really add the inheritance to my project again, so uh, what happens in the inheritance is that we have methods that's already exist in the person class but let's say that we really want to add something to the person class and so that that extension would be populated to the student as well and uh, by this example you can also modify the string class let me give you another example so uh, in previous days if you really want to convert a uh, string to double what you do is double dot uh, try purse something like that or purse and then pass the string that's it so we have to do like this so uh, if we really want let's say I have a number and I want to convert it to double there is no method so I have to call the double class and then call the purse method to do it so let's say that I want to add a method to this string class so that I have the two double methods so that I could use it and get the double from the number let's do it pretty quick so public static void and then whatever name that you choose to double in this case I'm choosing and then this and then I'm saying string and then I'm saying that str and uh, we really don't want to pass anything to our function we just want to invoke it so uh, in the return Oh, rather than void we're going to return something in this case we're returning double and return double dot first dot str that's it so if we just go to any any class let's say any any uh, portion of the app let's say in the program and we have to uh, include the namespace or uh, namespace of the extension class extension says so let's just delete those or exclude those files so that I don't end up having an error and import this person so that I don't have any compilation error let's see do I have any compilation error so I have so this access require okay student you're not really interested in this right now let's just compile and we're successful so uh, let's really import our extension namespace extension method that's it let's say we have a number var number and it is coming from a string that's it. string and we want to double that's it now if you hover over you can see that it's a type, type of double that we just added via extension methods so it's that simple 
And another thing I really uh, want to show as an extension method uh, so that uh, <coughs> you can understand that you could add more things to any uh, fixed class. So if you see the person class, it's really fixed. You can we are not adding anything here, but we really want to add something so that it will uh, uh, eventually come up in the student class and in the teacher class. So that's the extensibility that we want to have. So by this extension method, we're going to have this functionality. So let's create the person class again. So var, uh, sorry, student class again. Um, so we haven't included the namespace. See, you have the extension method from the person by using the extension method example. So it may uh, require some properties. That's the first name, Elias. Just give the Elias and run it and see that Elias is eating because the method calls the eating method. So that's it about extension methods. If you have uh, any more questions, you can shoot. But uh, here I'm just showing the basic things. There are really very broad topics about extension methods. So uh, and system.link is really the best example for uh, extension methods. Now we're at the fourth topic at, at our object-oriented programming and, and this is called the encapsulation and most people really forget it and I'm going to give you an example, real-life example so that you could remember it for the rest of your life. So let's say we're selling something in this case we're selling burgers. So one burger is five dollars, two burgers are eight dollars and three burgers are eleven dollars. That's it, we put the price tag and let's say we put a money bowl so that uh, guys could take the burgers and put the money in the bowl. So what do you think that happened in real life? So the thing is going to happen is most people are not going to pay the exact money. Some may pay but this is not really a good practice so you cannot run your business like that you really don't have a guarantee that you're getting the exact money that you really ask for so that's really a problem so what you can do to solve this problem so what you can do is box those or encapsulate those in terms of programming so that uh, no one can get the burgers easily so what does that mean by easily so that uh, if anyone wants to have a burger they really have to go through the layer layer of protection and by this protection I mean that they if they pass the exact money five dollar and they will get the one burger they will not get two burgers so if they pass at least eight dollars, they will get two burgers. That's the concept. So from this concept, and encapsulations came in. Encapsulation also known as data hiding or data protection. So let's see some code on encapsulation. So so far you have seen the fields in my examples I haven't introduced the properties and this is the time that I'm going to introduce the properties but let's really see that how other programming language encapsulate and then we're going to the C sharp way and these ways still works on C sharp but C sharp have has better way to deal with it so let's see that how other languages do the encapsulation so let's say you have a first name field in your class and to hide this field you really don't want to express it as a public 
so far you have no the uh, access modifiers because I have talked about it so if you don't know access modifiers go uh, back and watch the video again so it's private so no one outside the class can access this field so to access this field what we can do is write a method named get first name and then return the uh, first name field from the class since it's a public method anyone can access it and the data inside the class will be passed through and to change the field we have uh, let's say we have a protection like that if name is null we are not setting the name the name name has to be something string concrete we're not checking the empty here but let's just assume that null is doing the same thing checking empty and null but it's not the uh, it's not the real world thing just assume that it does so we're checking it and then putting the name so that it's really appropriate so think about that if you have uh, more validation like you want to change uh, check some uh, format or uh, change check some pattern and then keep the data it's the best practice so that when people change the data you can check that it is it in uh, right format or right pattern and then you save it to the database or save it to your field something like that so this is how the encapsulation is done so these are known as getter and the set properties are known uh, set methods are known as setter so in c sharp what we do is just write the public string first name and then use the curly braces and say get and set the get and set implicitly means that we have a method named get first name which is really returning which is the get here which is really returning the first name and the set here is really going to set the first name from the name string that passed in the parameter so simple getter setters are implemented just like one line in C sharp that's really very elegant I think so what you do when you have conditions like this what you do so if you really want to explicitly define the getter and setter what you can do is after the get you can use the curly brace and let's say you do some stuff up there and then return the first name but the recommendation is do not do any heavyweight calculation in the getter method because we really want our code to be efficient to do many of the things in the get method will uh, make your program slow so the best way to change your uh, first name or the field is in the set method so if you have any validation kind of thing do it in the setter method not in the getter so that it reduces the time so this is ex exactly the code that you have seen in the set earlier so uh, instead of name that in the set method if you write a method we could uh, name the parameter as anything we like but uh, when we use C sharp and use the properties like this the default parameter is always the value so when you say value it means the parameter that passed in so we're checking the value if it is not null, then we are putting it to the field so you really have to have a field when you are explicitly defining it uh, other than that you really don't need another private field now let's see some coding we're in Visual Studio and I have codes for encapsulation. Let me include those. So, so far, uh, you have seen the public fields. So here we have private fields. These are fields. And we're doing this by the old programming way, the getter and setters. 
uh, as you can see that I have made those getter and setter we really have only two fields so that you could understand if you have more so you have to write more methods like this so to make it better in, we are going to uh, move on to the C sharp way this is the C sharp way you can write it the get and set so if it is just get and set what you can do you can do just write like this that's it so as you can see that we step by step upgraded our code so first we are doing it the regular programming style second we are doing it in C sharp style and then we're moving on to the only implicit style that we're not defining the code and in the four what you can do let's say you have a public field let's say you have a public field public get but you really want the set to be private you can do that uh, to make the set to private just write the private in front of set that's it you compile compile just fine if you really want the get to be private don't want to, it to be go outside just write the private in front of it that's it bill works just fine that's it so if you have any more questions about encapsulation let me know email me i will reply so let me go over very quick to the slides nowadays modular approach is very common and so far we have seen is a relationship what we have seen in the person and student relationship that was the is a relationship and has a relationship is really uh, said to be the modular approach so when first nasa was making the space satellite it was really very hard to put up that huge thing up in the space so what they did is they break this satellite into smaller modular pieces so that it could be go up in the sky very easily and then uh, combine those and work with it and each of the modules will be designed such a way so that if any of those are broken or chopped off the rest of the modules will work just fine so that's the modular concept so if smaller things breaks in the system or changes in the system it doesn't affect the whole system the system remains the same so let me give you a, a, a another example that you see in the market that's your motherboard so your motherboard is really designed in such a way so that it works uh, if some of the things are not there so uh, your motherboard is also required a processor a ram that's it and power supply of course but other than that if you don't have a gpu it will work just fine but some of the motherboards really require a gpu but mo in most cases a motherboard doesn't require a gpu or additional rams if you have one ram it's just work fine if you want to add many rams you can add it as much as you like so that's the modular approach and you can also add your tv card to your motherboard so that you can watch tv and so on so if you see the bike we really want to make this bike based on modular approach so what we really want to do is as you have seen that we have made these into pieces so that we could have the modular approach so we want a uh, a part that's really contained with the uh, tires so that we could add one or more or more than two tires as you've seen in movies that they have cycles which has more than two tires and uh, uh, more than two seats so that there could be two people could sit on the bike or cycle so something like that we could design based on uh, the modular approach so you may have the idea that what we want so we just break this into smaller pieces you can see the images so that's for the theory so what we want we want to inherit the bike 
this case the bike inherited from seat handle body tire paddle chain etc but the problem is c sharp is uh, c sharp supports one class at a time inheritance so you cannot inherit from multiple classes at once some language does support that like c plus plus but java and uh, php and c sharp doesn't support that or pb doesn't support that so what can you do about it? The, the way that you can follow if you really want to go with the uh, class approach that you make a class of chain. And then what you can do, you make a class of paddle which inherits from the chain, which is not very logical. Uh, if you really think that this should be separated, uh, this shouldn't be. But for the sake of work, we're just assuming that that's how it's done. And then we have tire class, which inherits the pedal class. So inherits the pedal class. And we have, then we have handle class, which inherits the tire class. And seat class inherits the handle class. And the body inherits the seat. And the bike inherits the body, and so on. So that's how we get the cycle it seems like a modular approach because we break it into smaller pieces but in the terms of modular approach what we have talked earlier that if the smaller piece is broken the other things should work but in this chain of command if any of those are broken the others will not work so it's not really a modular approach so what you can do is look for interfaces so interfaces are the way to do the modular approach. So what is an interface? An interface is like contracts that you must implement in your code. So an interface is like, as we've said, that contract says something, 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 and you uh, refer that, if you refer that interface in your code, let's say in class, in class and if you do that then you have to implement these conditions in your class that's it that's the interface so let's see some of the examples in coding we're in Visual Studio and here we have our interface uh, examples and for this interface examples I have used the uh, Visual Studio diagram tooling system and uh, the class diagram tooling system uh, many developers don't use it because uh, uh, but I really like to use it when I have many classes and diagrams it's really easier to work with it so let's really go to the diagram to see that what I did so what I have is a savable interface An interface is just a contract nothing else and it's really easy to write let's just go to that interface so that's the interface. I have a property and I have a method. By default, all the properties or method you make in the interface or write in the interface are public. That's it. And whenever you say that your class is dependent, dependent on an interface and you can do like the class as you have did in the uh, earlier class, just go to the modular example one so in the class what you did is put the colon and write the class name to inherit from that class so if you really want to implement uh, the contracts of an interface you just write, uh, have to write the interfaces by comma that's it so you can write multiple interfaces but you cannot write multiple classes to inherit from so that's the thing so after I did implement the iSaveable because I have iSaveable here which has mm, changes and save methods so when I did implement this what happens is let's say I don't have any code just put this code away clean up and let's say I write manually that iSaveable so when I write iSaveable if I 
trying to compile my code right now, I will have get the errors that says that I didn't implement the changes property and uh, save method. So I must have to implement this. So if you really want to implement, you could manually write the methods or go to the interface or and then press control and then dot, you will see that uh, option comes up and says that implement interface I saveable. Just put enter and you will see the methods that have uh, declared in the contracts will be written in your class. That's it. Now it's your job to implement those methods properly to work uh, with your application. So that's how you can work with interface. So let's really copy paste our code. So I haven't done anything. I just uh made those regions uh, sorry uh, I, I just uh, implemented those so that you understand that uh, whenever i make uh, a class dependable of an interface it should be uh, implemented that's it i really like to have regions in my code so the easiest way to have uh, to make more interfaces by the diagram tool let's uh, help you make another one by diagram let's say I have modular example uh, for class and I really want to have an interface name I test and I want the properties or methods so if you don't see this uh, option here uh, the details you can go to if you really go to view and then others then class details you'll see this uh, doc toolbox and you can write the methods that you want to implement let's say test and example to methods and you can change change the types from here let's say you want an int an example and if you really want to have parameters let's say x is a decimal something like that if you want to add another parameter so it's a double so on so to make it dependable what you can do is you can click on it toolbox and just call it like this then the methods will already be implemented in your code just double click it you'll see it it's that easy to just use the diagram so how to get the diagram it's really easy go to add new item and go to class diagram we have to find the class diagram class diagram and add it to your project and design your classes with it let's really go over our uh, modular example 2 to see that uh, how I implement it or what I did different in it, in it so let's say you have a save method already exist in your class and you want or you implemented a interface that also want to implement a save method so how we are going to distinguish those those two the easy way to distinguish or do the right thing is explicitly write your uh, interface then the method name that's it and it's just a ret returning function it's not a public function but you could write a public function if you want oh sorry so if you if you make it public you'll get a compilation error because uh, compiler will be confused that which function it will call but inside the class you can have two same name function one is private one is public by using interfaces only that's it and you don't have to make the parameters different you can have it it will compile just fine compile just fine that's it and another thing about the interfaces even though that the interface was in designed um, to make sure that you implemented the contracts 
So sometimes you will change the previous contracts, but the best way to do, let's say that I really want to add a new method to this iSavable. Let's say that I want to add, uh, let's say that point new method. So what will happen that it will break all the codes around that whole application. So that's we don't want. So if you now build it, so it, it will complain that most of the classes doesn't implement this new method. So that's a problem. That's really uh, opposite of what we are trying to do. We're trying to make that the, if smaller thing breaks, the system will work just fine. To solve this problem, what you can do is write a new interface and then uh, Im implement or inherit your class from that interface again. So what I really meant to say is, let's say that you want to make that new uh, method to append in your uh, modular example two. So rather than writing it into I savable, uh, you write a new method and interface. And interfaces are starts with I capital I. That's the uh, C sharp convention. Let's say a new inter that's it and write our method the new method new method and we want to implement this new method this new method to our modular example 3 so get the inheritance and just drag it that's it you get the inheritance list over here so if I just go to the code details I'll see that new method is implemented but my others code didn't break so that's really important so let's go to our slides and go over very quickly so far we have seen destructors so I disposable is another example of interface and destructor that really works better than the class destructor what is this Let's really go to the coding and let's see that we are in Visual Studio. So let's see some coding. I am assuming that you have seen in many places that using keyword, or if you haven't seen it, you're going to learn it. So what the using keyword does is you create an object, like say that person, new person, and you want that person to be destroyed after this execution. So using means destroy the person object uh, or keep the person object inside this block of code. Keep the person object lifecycle inside this block of code. This is the using, using means. So you can use this keyword if you have an implementation of i disposable in your class that's it that's when the i disposable is needed really so if you really go to this interfaces you will see that there is a class destructor class with i disposable so when you really implement the i disposable method uh, sorry i disposable interface you really have to implement a method called dispose so a dispose method does is it uh, calls as soon as the using uh, uh, block is done so let's see some example oh let's certainly do something here right line the world that's it so let's run our project you'll see that class is created it's from that destructor we have class is created console right line and then we are printing the capacity like the previous and then the dispose method is called and then the hello world is called so if you really go to the method class is created, capacity is printed, and then uh, as you can see that the destructor was never called. The destructor will call if we set this to null and uh, if we call the garbage collector in. 
So as you can see that it's a very advanced and very uh, quick way to dispose your classes. So let's go to the slides again. So far we have seen adding a new method to break our existing code so we have to um, make another interface to make it more modular. So that's really very important point. Now we are at the fifth step of object-oriented programming which is polymorphism and there are really uh, various definitions of polymorphism and many websites defines it differently I simplified it this way polymorphism means same thing in different kinds so to simplify that let's say you have a toy let's say you have a toy and it's just a toy and it's the same toy you can buy in red green and blue color that's it the three different flavor that's polymorphism that's the real life example so let's see that how to implement polymorphism in your code so when people ask an interview question that what is polymorphism you can say that same thing in different kind and then say the programmatic way or the programmatic definition that how you can uh, implement the polymorphism in your code the way is inherit your class from a base class that's the first step the second step is override a method from a base class so you have to override we haven't seen override yet but we're going to see it right now so override a method from your base class in uh, C++ or C sharp you have to mark the method as virtual but in Java you don't have to do this so keep in mind access modifiers because these are going to be problematic if you don't remember and this is how you implement the polymorphism so keep in mind the access modifiers we're not going to go over those again to keep you remind that access modifier is a big factor in this polymorphism let's see an example let's say you have an animal class and then will have some properties that we don't want to see let's say they have some common properties and they have a method called talk so when we call the method let's assume that the print method actually console.write line and it's actually printing that generic nemo talking that's it so uh, as you have seen in the earlier examples inheritance that you can in inherit from person to student and person to teacher and we're going to do the same thing here so what we're going to do is we are going to inherit the animal class uh, sorry we're going to inherit the dog class from animal but we really want to change the dog behavior because dog really uh, talks differently uh, they bark and it will be really illogical to have the generic animal talking we can have that but let's really assume that we have a different class the different uh, class which really represents a different object so from the animal we are defining the dog so to implement the dog we really need a something different in the talk method to make that talk method different we really need to override that talk method so we're really saying uh, inherits but here you really have to put the colon in the C sharp and override and dogs just say oof that's it return so so how we're going to print it print dog dot talk and we will see in the console that it says that oof that's it so let's say we have another class called cat and we really want its behavior to say meal so we're really overriding the uh, talk method in the cat class and it's very simple and straightforward I don't think it would be a problem to understand and when you call the cat dot talk it will say meal so let's say you have human 
So human says hello. And they talk, they say hello. That's it. So it's pretty straightforward. Let's say I want to implement it. I really didn't implement the cat method. Cat. I really didn't override the cat cat's talk method. So what will going to happen is it's a void method. So and already have a print. So we don't have to put it in the print. We just say cat dot talk. So when we uh, call that method, it will uh, print out the generic animal talk. That's it. So let's see some of those in coding. I'm in Visual Studio and I have examples for polymorphism. Let's include this. So for this polymorphism, I have introduced the new person class with person poly. It's not real different, but um, it has virtual keyword in front of the what method. So if you see the regular person class, it doesn't have any virtual keyword in front of it. But uh, here you have a virtual keyword before the what method. So in C sharp, if you want to override a method, you really need the virtual keyword in front of it. So if the developer doesn't put a virtual keyword in it, so if they don't, you cannot override it. So if they do, that means they're allowing you to override their method. So if they don't have that override, you could still uh, modify it by the extension method. Remember the extension method I showed you? It was specially designed to solve this kind of problem. So uh, now, if I really want to implement this walk method, if I go to my polymorphism one example and see that uh, polymorphism one in, uh, inherits from person poly and it's just a simple constructor and here I'm overriding the method walk and in the walk it will say that the first name the base dot first name as we've seen that base and these means so base dot first name is walking from polymorphism one class so I think I have an example of it let's see okay here is an example of polymorphism I just created the first uh, polymorphism one class poly and then uh, ask it to work and if you really go to the default walk method it said that uh, the first name is working that's it but if it's really overridden then the method should look like this that the first name is working from polymorphism one class so if you really successful with overriding the method the work method will display that it is from polymorphism one class and then we're changing it and then again say poly one uh, sorry poly dot work and then we are having the polymorphism three class let's go to that two let's see that what we did in two so in two what we're doing is calling the base method so the base method is actually the method here is working so if you call this walk it will print uh, it will first print this that the allies if the first name is allies allies is walking and second it will print that allies is walking from polymorphism two class that's it and if you go to the polymorphism three example you'll see that it only says that print from polymorphism three class but different thing about this class is overriding so overriding is a type of polymorphism it's really called static polymorphism or sometimes called ad hoc polymorphism but if you're asked in the interview question that what is polymorphism and if you really say that all right they will judge you that you are wrong but uh, in spite of that fact Wikipedia really defines it as a polymorphism so you can reference it if they don't know it because I have seen many people don't know it 
So you can say that overriding, uh, overloading, sorry, if I misspelled, that overloading is a type of polymorphism said to be static or ad hoc polymorphism. So what is really overloading? Overloading can be achieved by uh, same type of name in the method but with different parameters. And parameters different means the parameters could be the type different or the uh, number of parameters are different based on two concepts. So if you have a return type different, it doesn't matter. The compiler will give you an error. So if you have two methods like same, and if I really try to compile it, I will have an error. I will have an error. But if I have a different uh, parameter or additional Oh, so it is complaining that we have same number of parameters. It was just fine, sir. The mistake. So let's say we have another thing and let's just compile it and it's just fine. So this is how you can overload a method. And another thing that you can do is just change the data type. It will give you an error. So just comment out and then build and it's just fine. This is called overloading. These two ways you can overload a method and overload is said to be static polymorphism or ad hoc polymorphism. It doesn't have to be implemented after overriding, uh, sorry, after inheritance. It can be done anywhere in the class. If you have same name method, you could, uh, you're mostly uh, overloading those and uh, the great example of overloading is in the console.write line method. So if you just go to console.write line, you will see that there are 19 overloads. The overloads are shown like this. So if you go that, it takes a parameter with boolean, it takes a parameter with character, something like that. So this type of functionality are given to mm, uh, make the programming much more uh, flexible. So as you can see that in the tree, I have lots of those uh, parameters, uh, lots of those uh, overloading methods based on what first name, last name, so that I could change. I could change the uh, first name and I could also, let's just delete this. We change the first name, I could at the same time change the first and last name and change these properties, change base properties, base properties when you change the parent class properties, something like that. So let's really print out our console program. See that Elias is working, Elias is working from polymorphism one class uh, by this method and we change the Elias name to hello and then hello is working and then uh, working from polymorphism one class yeah hello is working from polymorphism one class so far that's correct so after that we are uh, creating the polymorphism three class where we are calling um, calling the base class of uh, sorry we, we are just calling the Let's see, let's just go over quick. Just go to this. If you if you, you, you can go to any method by uh, uh, stepping into the method and press F12. That's it, you will go to the definition of the method. So here uh, you can see that we, I have uh, comment out the base.walk. So if we have base.walk, what will happen is we will have Elias is walking again and then uh, Elias is walking from polymorphism 3 class and then then we have also changed it to hello and then call the walk it will do the same thing and then we change the properties these first these last base first base last and then console print out the first name the first name will be the this name that we have changed 
if you see that this first so uh, poly first name would be this first as you can see that this means the upper class that you are seeing and rest of the uh, rest of are very easy if you have any question because it's very complicated if you don't spend some time uh, so I suggest you to download the code and spend some time in it and try to understand it's very simple but if you really watch the video it will be complicated because uh, some of the things I feel complicated right now because I have to go through the code and uh, really understand that what it's doing so really download the code and go through the code it's really easy but you have to spend some little more time in it that's it let's go to our slides so we haven't done uh, the two string method uh, overloading two string method so uh, with every object you will get uh, the few methods that are tied with the object class in C sharp everything is derived from the object class so object class has few methods to string uh, equals uh, something like that a few methods so these methods are common to every primitive type and every object in C sharp whatever you make whatever class you make that that will be there so the two string method is very common let's say you have a number and you want to make it to a string and you just use the two string method that's it so let's say you have defined a new class and uh, you uh, use the two string method and then you will see the name of the class and with the namespace so if you really want to change that two string method to behave dif differently you can just override it and that's good that could be your assignment to try it out it's very simple so method method overloading we have talked in the coding that it's uh, ad hoc polymorphism or say to be uh, static static po polymorphism it's very simple to do calling by base class we have seen it and static modifiers you can check out the link generic says were released with Docker framework 2.0 around 2005 generic says released to solve special kind of problem and if you know C++ templating it is similar but not the same thing and in this session we're going to talk about very basics of generics we're not going to go very deep into it and the reason behind I'm talking about generics is because it is a type of polymorphism it's known as parametric polymorphism so let's see some of those in coding I'm in Visual Studio and I have an example called vector if if you have ever uh, done any C++, uh, C++ programming, you'll know that there is a data type called vector, which is which implements the array and abstract the way that uh, abstracts the uh, limitations of array and give better functionalities. So we have the same thing in C sharp. It's called the list. So I made a new data type called vector, and I really didn't go through the underlying coding. Uh, the complexity I just uh, make the list to work behind the scene that's it I just use it to prove or show you the generics is that's it nothing else so that's why I make the simple code so whenever in C sharp you'll see these angle brackets you have to understand that this is the generics that's it and uh, the thing that put into the angle brackets are the data type the data type that you put the system will be look like that the object or class will be look like that so here I have the list or the vector only for integers so whenever I create this vector I will have only the integer numbers to add in the list that's it I have the add capabilities I just call the add function uh, and uh, in the constructors I really make the uh, capacity to 100 and you can change it by explicitly saying the capacity in the constructor and it's really very straightforward code I also have a new me uh, additional method called print all it will print all the list items in the console and you can get any uh, positioned item 
and it, you see that it works like an array to have this third bracket working in my class I have to overload uh, the uh, operators but I really I was really very lazy at this point and uh, just go over very quick uh, I'm in my main program and I may have an example okay this is my vector class that I have created with 200 capacity it means 200 items are already created in the array as now and then I'm adding the items to the array and printing off that's simple that's it so let's really print it 23 123 and then hello world is the print statement so let's really minimize that print off so the problem is you cannot add a string to this class if you do this you, you will have an error to solve this problem the generics are introduced so we have also a generic class for this vector type and as you can see that in the previous example I have used the int and here I'm saying D and the T is came from the template name that I have defined after the class name so to make a class generic what you can do that uh, put your cursor after the class name and use the angle bracket and then name of the template template that you want to use as generic and if you have more than one template write it with comma more that's it so if we really want to replace that T just put this name template and it will work just fine so uh, and in most example you are going to see the T because that's really very common and uh, try to use the common names because it will be helpful and that's it it's not very a rocket science so whenever someone uh, creates your class they're going to put uh, the data type in between those angle brackets and you are going to have the benefit or they are going to have the benefit of generics. So let's really compile this and put this to T and let's for the simplicity uh, example purpose uh, let's keep another uh, template parameter name more. So what's the problem there? And okay. So let's remove this. Well and successful. So let's really see this in action. Our program. Here is my uh, generic class. Previously, it has only uh, one generic parameter, but now I have used another generic parameter, which is more, which is no use in the class. As you can see, when I come, up, I will see the parameter name, and I will see that int. It's actually nothing, but let's say it's in it is not going to use in the application but for to make you understand I'm, I just gave two, two names in the templates so if you have two names or more than one names you could use it so here I'm uh, adding the in string because I'm taking the string template if I take the floating template then I could do it with floating numbers as well so if I print it run it just prints the things that I put in the list that's it that's simple so let's go get over to the code uh, slides and so I'm in the slides so let's get over this very quick so why generics we if, if you are a C sharp programmer and I have talked uh, very recently that every type in C sharp is uh, implemented or inherited from the object class even the primitive types so why need generics we could just write the object that's it uh, and the generics comes for the performance impacts it really uh, makes a huge difference on 
performance when it comes to work with uh, maybe 2,000 or 10,000 data. So try this example if it compiles. I haven't compiled, but I really assume that it should compile. And try it with uh, 10,000 data and try it with integer, uh, string, floating points, 10,000, and compare the times with this class, this T class, if it works. And if it doesn't work, then make uh, find the code or uh, debug the code or uh, Google for it, uh, find the solution, and then compare the performance. You will see the better performance will be gained by generic sys. That's why generic sys are there. And when you do uh, something like these boxes, the C sharp under the hood does some boxing and unboxing. So uh, boxing and unboxing is good for some time. And for these type of scenarios, boxing and unboxing really make a huge impact on performance in a negative side, of course. To enforce the polymorphism, what you can do is use interface, either interface or abstract class. We haven't talked about abstract class, but it's really uh, same as interfaces, but an abstract class could have definitions with other methods, but an interface will never have any definition of any method. That's the difference and nothing is different than the contracts. The contracts implementation are really same. If you don't implement the abstract class uh, contracts, you will get an error in the compile time. So let's say you have a class and you really want to enforce the polymorphism of this uh, talk method. So how you can do it, you can do it by abstract class just put the abstract keyword in front of your class and uh, make a method public abstract so that it must be implemented by the developer who implements the class or inherits from this class that's how you're going to enforce the polymorphism and good thing about abstract class is it could have definitions and interface couldn't have and we're going to see some uh, real world examples how you could use interface and abstract class in the strategy pattern but uh, for that time being just keep it simple let's see some coding previously you have seen that uh, to uh, do the polymorphism, what we did is put the method as virtual keyword in the in the base class. So to work with abstract class, we just put the abstract keyword and put the method as abstract must put the public if you don't put public it will not work so if now that this class is implementing not implementing this method see the error that it's not implemented oh so we you have to remove the uh, definitions as well so remove the definitions so if we just go and build it you'll see there that it doesn't implement the what method so this is how you're going to enforce the polymorphism in your code so we just keep it as it was that's it so abstract class versus interface it's a very interesting thing and you should know those these are very important so abstract class can implement uh, or share common implementation but uh, on the other hand interface couldn't have any implementation it will only keep properties and the method names that's it and single inheritance supported only that's really downside downside of abstract method and 
a class can inherit multiple classes. It's really upside for the interfaces. And members can have different access modifiers. And this is also an upside that all the members could be different. Uh, all the mem members shouldn't have to have the same modifier as public. You could have some hidden layers. And you, uh, in the interface, you really have to have all the members as public. It's really a downside. So may contain constructor, destructor, public prop uh, properties, functions, and so on. Contracts. Contracts will be the abstract methods. And for VB, it is must inherit, if I'm not wrong, because I have done VB a very long time ago. So uh, the abstract, instead of the abstract, if you're doing VB coding, uh, put the must inherit keyword. That's it. Uh, and may only contain properties and function functions contracts that's it nothing more but it can also hold implementation of functions rather than just the contracts so these are the upsides and downsides now we're going to talk about the strategy pattern and it is going to be a very good example for what you have learned throughout this session and why we need this over the years I have seen a lot of hardcore developers overuse or overdue inheritance so what happens is uh, eventually they will end up with a very inflexible system which is very hard to modify even though they implemented or all the OOP concept but uh, they design the system in such a way or is a relationship they follow is a relationship that much hard way so that the system become so inflexible that it becomes very hard to modify or if you change in one place it the system breaks the whole system breaks that's a really problem that's really against our modular approach so let's see an example of per simulator to address some problems so let's say we have a bird simulator abstract class the abstract class is named as abstract bar that's it so the class have some properties like the color of the board or how it speaks something like that and have some properties like uh, display method the display method should be unique for every bar that how the display and the fly method uh, should be void and it will print that they are flying or not flying and speak method should be uh, how they are speaking that's it so we are really interested in the uh, display method but let's see that how it goes the how the design goes so let's say that I want to implement a parrot bar class parrot class from the bar abstract class so what I did is made a concrete parrot class from the abstract class and then uh, write the display method and when I print the display method I see the parrot object so let's say I have another bird which is penguin and I inherit it from bird and when I display it I see the penguin but penguins have a special ability that they cannot uh, sorry they cannot fly and but they can swim so they have special ability ability they can swim but they cannot fly so I'm really making the fly method to private and we really have to write this speak methods differently because all of the words speak differently let's say we have ostrich and same thing display method we have to write ostrich do not fly so we are uh, changing the fly method somehow and uh, changing the speak method as well so let's say we have a rubber bird and rubber bird don't fly don't speak display as a rubber bird that's it so what you have seen 
in this example. You have seen that many places I have to private fly. So instead of private fly, if there is a complexity in the method, I really have to overdo all of these methods in every places. As you can see that in most places I have to rewrite the three methods at all because we have the two different kinds of bird. So assume that here we're talking about bird but in a business application you are going to have different kinds of object. Bird have some similarities but in a business application you have very less similarities. So you're, what is going to happen is and you are end up writing the every code or every function again and again. So it's a really bad solution. So let's see our observation. In a simple perspective view it's a good design but there are a lot of code duplication in a speed fly behavior as you've seen and we don't want our code uh, or we don't our code to be wet we want our code to be dry as much as possible and think if you have 100 methods in a class it could possible some business apps really have 100 methods in a class so if you have so if you're really doing such things, so what will happen is you will end up writing these 100 methods in 100 different places. So that would be really tedious and a very bad solution for your problem. So if you remember from the previous slide, we could do use the interfaces or could use the hazard relationship so that we could achieve the modular approach. So let's do it then. So in this case, we have abstract bar, parrot, penguin, something, so on. So let's say that we have iFly interface and which have only method fly and we have another interface called iSwim and iSpeak and so on. So parrot only implements iFly and iSpeak because they speak and they fly. But they do not swim. So penguins, they are uh, swimmers and they also speak, so, but they do not fly, so they are not going to implement the fly interface. And ostrich only speak, they don't swim, don't fly. And if we really observe the design, it's really a good design. There is no confusion with it. The problem with this design is that if you have 100 or 20 classes, then you have to write the same methods every time, which is also a very wet solution. You're writing the same type of code again and again, which is really very tedious, which may seem very good, but very tedious. So again, we are st stuck with the problem 100 methods, we have to write the 100 uh, methods again. So we really want to reuse our code and we can do it here, so it's a big problem. So let's really do something about it. And if you remember from the abstract class versus interface, there is the solution uh, exist. So the solution can be done by analyzing the problem or doing the problem something differently. So here, what we are doing is in the properties we are saying that abstract class should also have I fly behavior, I swim behavior, or speak behavior as well. And we have these three methods. So if you have a real world application, you would have uh, the relative methods for that application. And we have an abstract method called display. So what we're going to do is we're going to make the interfaces again. But this time, rather than just to have the interfaces, we are going to implement uh, classes from this interface. So we have a fly behavior so which implements this interface I fly and implements the fly method and we also have no fly behavior which will say that the bird cannot fly. 
so it's implemented so if you have uh, 10 different type of fly behaviors just write the 10 different type of fly behavior it's really will be odd if you have 100 types of fly behavior so that will be a good solution so if you have two types of fly solution or 10 types just write it down or write the class for that type so swim we have swimming behavior no swimming behavior and so on speak no speak or slash island behavior or something like that so what we're going to do is we're going to initialize these behaviors based on uh, our object or based on our requirements so let's see some of those encoding I'm here in Visual Studio with my strategy pattern solution so I really designed the solution by the class diagram as you have seen in the slides I have done nothing differently than the things are in the slide so I have I swim interface uh, sorry I fly interface which has a fly method and fly behavior a class which implements the I fly so it has a fly method and if you just go to the code you code you'll see that I'm flying that's it that's how simple it is so that's our bird class abstract class which has three behavior properties which is based on I fly I speak and I swim and if you just go to the code Here in the abstract class, I just implemented these three interfaces and I really have three properties, public properties with I speak, I fly and I uh, swim and I really have a constructor, an explicit constructor which really required to specify those three things. So in those methods, so I have fly speak and swim method so what this does it, it, it really just call the swim behavior dot swim so whatever behavior we pick in the creation time will be just called by the method that's it so it's doing nothing interesting but just calling the behaviors so if we have an error we are just printing it to the console that simple it is so let's go to a class called parrot that how we implemented it a parrot implements from bar and in the base constructor I uh, sorry in the constructor I'm calling the base constructor with the new fly behavior parrot speak behavior I have a parrot speak behavior uh, yeah this time I really use the uh, class diagram and copy paste some of this and so some of the speak behaviors are in uh, the speak behavior.cs file so as you can see that I haven't put those into the separate files so I got confused that where it is so the best way to do this stuff is to put those into separate files so I have the parrot speak behavior class which inherit uh, sorry implements the I speak and in the I speak uh, in the speak method I'm just saying that parrot noise that's it so every board has different noise so that's why I just write the different noises and for generally I just put the bird noise speak behavior and in parrot I just implemented the parrot speak behavior and parrot doesn't swim so I just introduce the no swim behavior and if you just go to the no swim behavior you can find might be in swim behavior so no swim behavior I can swim and swim behavior says I'm swimming that's it everything is very simple nothing is complicated here but 
uh, you really have to go through the codes and really have to take some time if you're new to the coding because if you don't do that uh, it will be really hard for you to understand and that's it and in the display it just says that I'm paired and this is how all the others are implemented so if you just go to the program it's a console app and I'm creating all the birds and uh, displaying uh, flying and calling every method and let's say that what's happened ostrich cannot fly fly so in the fly method it will say that I can fly but uh, after that I'm modifying the flying behavior with uh, uh, with the new fly behavior so if again if I call the fly method then it will can fly so it's pretty simple Let, let's just print it out and describe every line so this is an ostrich from this display line and it cannot fly because in the flying behavior we have no fly behavior and after modifying the fly behavior it's just a printing statement and then I'm changing the flying behavior by new flying behavior and then it can fly so in the noise speak it says ostrich noise and swim it cannot swim the parrot displays that it's a parrot I'm flying parrot noise I cannot swim so this is how all the others are implemented and rubber bird is in silence that's it so go through the codes dig into it if you have any problem mail me I will get right back to you so it's very simple and try to dig into the code otherwise you can't get it uh, let's go over to the slides and let's see our observation so this is the much better solution than all the others and at this point we could design our or extend our design to any level and we will have really less problem and it will be highly configurable however uh, it solves many of the problem but there is no silver bullet for every problem scenario so use it use this pattern when you think that it will work don't make it a silver bullet and try to solve every problem with this solution pattern that's it finally happy coding try to make your coding more modular and readable and to make your code readable don't forget to use the naming conventions in the demo coding I really haven't uh, show you the naming conventions but it's really a good practice when you write uh, real-life code or uh, enterprise code you should follow the naming conventions it's really very helpful and make your code much more readable another thing I really like to show and uh, that I do in my coding in personal life that you can make your code more readable by Visual Studio documentation system so let me switch over to Visual Studio for now so I'm in Visual Studio so what you can do let's say you write a method and you want to uh, give some hint to the developer who will use your method to do that you could use a three times slash and you will get a summary so let's say you have a uh, method let's say it has a string param let's say a string param and if you do the third slash you will you'll get a summary session so let's say it's a method just for simple and it's a param so when a developer access your method let's say that I'm accessing from here so when I say uh, what is it it was eat so when I say eat see that you will get the description of the method it is a method so whatever you write you will see the description so it is really helpful for other developers who will use your framework or assembly uh, in the developing uh, development life so make your code 
much more readable by these documentations. And uh, you can also manage your documentations by the class diagram that I have shown earlier. So in this uh, method, when you uh, try to access the parameter, you'll see the detail of the parameter. It's really very helpful. And uh, if we go to our uh, class diagram design, uh, here you can also write uh, much more details. If you go to the properties, you will see that there are summary, remarks, many things. The things that I write in short uh, in the code, you could write it from here as well. And finally, do not use uh, inheritance uh, where you don't need it because I have seen many I have seen many developers many hardcore developers who really do overuse their inheritance and the system become infle inflexible so keep in mind that where I use the inheritance that where I was copying the data and where I really need to make the code more dry and think of the inheritance as logic so if you have any logic to make the code inheritance or use the inheritance do it but if you don't have any logic don't do it and don't try to make all the solution as a strategy pattern or uh, try to solve all the problems with modular approach these all solutions are for specific purpose unless you need it don't use it but always try to organize your code in with classes and regions it is much more readable and better and if you have any questions mail me so thank you for uh, watching this video and session and to mail me uh, mail on this address on cream at developersorganism.com and you guys can google me and find my blog I have a blog and I'm from developers organism we make products for developers and we are very creative to have 8 to 5 time we work remotely so you can join us and you can find us at Facebook our site is currently in under construction it will be done very soon so if you really want to join our project you have to see our the first intro video uh, where we have given the email address for joining the project and that's it thank you